so welcome everyone. Uh, we're so excited to welcome you to our second annual Arbor Day webinar conference hosted by Rice Creek Field Station and the Canal Forest Restoration Project. I'm Kristen Haynes, the Assistant Director of Rice Creek Field Station, and um, I'm joined here as my co-host, uh, Piper Warren, who's an intern for the Canal Forest Restoration Project. Um, and uh, we, I, I just have one quick note um, about Zoom. So we're gonna ask um, folks, I know you probably know the drill, but please keep yourself uh, muted. Um, we will have time at the end for any questions and you can either unmute yourself to ask the questions or you can add them to the chat either way. Um, well, we are, we are thrilled to welcome um, Richard Haran today um, as one of our webinar presenters. Uh, I love, um, I mentioned in our last webinar, but I love how being involved with this project allows us to connect with other people who care about trees and similar projects. And it just so happens that um, Richard is a neighbor of Rice Creek Field Station. And he reached out to us um, when he learned about our project, just being excited and kind of explaining this other project that he's been involved in that resulted in a book. Um, and it's, it's really amazing how these interactions happen. Um, so I'm thrilled uh, that we'll get to hear about that project and that book today. Um, Richard Haran has had a really interesting career uh, working as, as a nurse, um, traveling as a professional boxer, uh, teaching English in other countries. Um, and for the time being, he's located right next to Bryce Creek Field Station in Oswego. Um, um, so, Let's all uh, welcome Richard. Uh, thank you, Kristen. I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is really fortuitous. Um, before the COVID hit, we were down in Key West, Florida, uh, enjoying sort of semi-retirement. Um, but um, fate would have it that we would uh, return to the southern shores of Lake Ontario and uh, we're very glad to be here. Um, this is a little treasure in the corner of our nation, uh, Rice Creek, uh, something like 750 acres of nothing but woods um, and ponds and streams. Uh, we've been very, very lucky to be here. And again, uh, the idea that you have a forest restoration project going on um, and I have had one going on for about 15 years now. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but once I get talking about uh, my seeds project, uh, which is truly more of a project than, than a book, um, I, I, I can talk all day. So I better get started. Uh, since we are celebrating Arbor Day, we're celebrating trees. We as humans uh, owe a great deal to trees. Um, not only did we sort of begin our, our evolution in them, um, but they provide um, the, the much needed um, oxygen that we of course breathe. They've been around for 350 million years. Um, they introduced uh, sexual uh, reproduction um, to the planet, um, no small feat. Um, so uh, let, let me um, start my presentation here. Uh, I, this book came out in 2011 um, and um, I, I about uh, six months ago noticed that it was selling like hotcakes. It was the number one book under Kindles being sold um, for about three days. I don't know um, how Amazon figures that out. But um, anyway, for some reason, I think COVID related, people are realizing, wow, trees, seeds, uh, this is all quite meaningful uh, in a world that seems to be spinning out of control. Let's look to our, our trees for the answers. So, um, so this um, book, as I said, is more a project that, than a book. And I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. But it's had... Um, uh, its day. And so here I am at Eudora Royalty's house, 
back around 2010 or 11, uh, picking up some, as I recall, it was a water oak. Uh, there had been an, an event, a near tornado as I came into town. Uh, so there were, uh, it was like uh, the skies had opened up and, and, um, and, and had created all of these, um, these seeds on the ground for me <laughs> as a welcoming. And so I didn't really have to climb up these massive trees to try and get the seeds. They were all littered all over the ground. Um, but there I am. Uh, this is her backyard. And I'll get to some of these things. So um, I'm going to talk about the growth of my own idea. Um, but first, a couple of thoughts about um, you know how important seeds, uh, how important trees are to us all, and particularly writers. Um, as I say, there is no other art form that was, uh, and now we have Kindles, of course, as dependent on another living species as the art of writing and the business of publishing. So without this sacred wood flesh, um, writers' thoughts and ideas would, would never see the light of day. So there is this special bond that writers have uh, with the written word. I do not re read too much. Um, on Kindle, nor do I, I, I try to avoid reading online, but um, that's just, um, you know, my old fuddy dud way. But there, I do feel a very special tactile um, relationship with, with trees. And so uh, the feeling of a book in my hand is a very special kind of sacred feeling. So uh, we know that um, that these trees provide the oxygen um, that gives us life. And so um, one tree basically uh, is enough to support he two human beings throughout their lifetime. An acre of trees um, consumes the amount of carbon dioxide equivalent to that produced by driving an average car for 26,000 miles. So for every acre of, of, of woods, um, that sort of covers uh, the carbon um, released by those by a car each year uh, in a family. So we have um, much to be thankful for. All right, um, the project. So um, back around 2000, when my girls were little, we would drive down to um, Dauphin Island off the coast of um, Alabama in the Gulf of Mexico for vacation during the school year. And uh, one year, uh, I decided that we would take a little more time and do some historical tours. Um, so the girls would learn a little more about the country instead of just driving through it so speedily. So the first stop was at um, Abraham Lincoln's house. And uh, so I had a, a kind of a preternatural event happen there. Uh, there's the house. Um, they do a nice job, um, you know, with. Uh, with tourists and, and the, the docents give a wonderful tour and the inside is really interesting. So anyway, when, when we were ushered into the living room, if you can see on the, re on the left side of your screen, the two windows, um, between those two windows on the left side, uh, there was a picture of Abe Lincoln standing next to a small little spindly tree out in front of the house. And you can see that tree um, in this photograph. So I had to stop the docent and, and ask him, uh, gee, is that tree outside the same one that was in the photograph that uh, Lincoln is standing next to? And he said, yes, in fact, it was. Um, and at that moment, I had a sort of premonition. There was just something uh, pulling me out to that tree. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, the tour continued, but I, I sort of ran through it and found myself out in front of that tree, looking at it, looking for a plaque commemorating the idea that that Lincoln had contact with that tree. Um, and uh, so on the ground there uh, were the little basswood seeds. If you know what a basswood seed looks like, it looks just like a pea, about the same size, only of course it has a woody seed covering. and. Um, is uh, not quite so green. But um, anyway, I found myself jamming those things into my pocket. Um, and that was the start of it. Um, here's the preternatural event. When I went back um, after the book had come out, I called the, the museum and asked them about that picture that was hanging in the living room. Um, 
And so no matter who I spoke with, they all assured me that that picture never ever uh, hung in the uh, Lincoln House. Uh, it was actually a picture that uh, was at the state capitol and never been uh, moved over there. So um, I never quite could figure that out, but I can tell you as a person who's had a lot of ghostly experiences, there were a lot of preternatural events that happened throughout the collecting of seeds uh, from, you know, people uh, looking out at me from the window who weren't there and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not a crazy man, but uh, there is something about uh, this event of mine of going around collecting seeds uh, from the homes of my um, my idols, my childhood idols. And this wasn't just about literary people or historical figures. You know, I, I went to Muhammad Ali's home and so on. Um, but anyway, I had a lot of events like that. That being the first one, um, so amazing. Uh, no matter how many times I've asked the question about that picture hanging in the living room, I have been told multiple times that that event never happened. Um, so there we go. All right, next stop was Graceland. Um, if you've never been to Graceland, I completely recommend that event. Uh, it's not so much the house and as you can see the jumpsuit shrine or his, his um, uh, 727 plane out front, uh, the cheesy decor of the, of the house, all that stuff is great, but it's really um, experience. The, the greatest experience about Graceland is seeing people's faces as they walk through Graceland. Uh, so if you're a people watcher, that's the place for you. Uh, it's just amazing. Um, I, I still have vivid memories of people singing at the gravesite and um, people uh, becoming emotional, um, looking at the um, bathroom where he passed away and so on. Um, anyway. And the jumpsuit shrine, I mean, only in America. Anyway, as you can see from the jumpsuit shrine to the gravesite, that's the walkway there, you can see these wonderful maple trees. Uh, there are also some sweet gums. Um, uh, sweet gums are everywhere down south in Memphis. Uh, but these are maples, and uh, as luck would have it, there was nothing but maple keys, maple seeds littered all over the ground. And so, uh, point number two, um, back in 2000, I started picking them up and also jamming them in my pocket. Um, so here's how it all started. Um, then after that, I went back and realized, uh, you know, and there were some other stops like at William Faulkner's house, for example. Um, we stopped there. Um, and I, again, I continued picking up seeds, um, brought them back home. Uh, I was teaching at um, SUNY Oswego at the time. And, um, and, and so I started this project uh, where I was going to grow these seeds and then um, buy some acreage and, and then have a grove, a literary a famous person grove of my own where I would uh, have all these uh, trees growing from fa uh, famous people's homes. Uh, and, and most importantly, these are seeds from trees that had actual physical contact with these famous people. So I had invited my friend Carl uh, Leonard's uh, up to speak to uh, students at um, SUNY Oswego in the writing department. He was the um, senior uh, marketing manager at Harper Collins. Um, and so he came and spent the weekend with me. Um, and it was when he came downstairs at, I had this back room in a house that I no longer own in downtown Oswego. And um, I showed him some of the trees that I was growing. And uh, he was particularly smitten by um, a little uh, maple that had come from um, uh, from Pawtucket, um, the Pawtucketville in uh, Massachusetts, right, out, right outside Lowell, where uh, Jack Kerouac had grown up. And this was an old tree uh, that was right near uh, the home that he had grown up in. And so anyway, those, maples had grown pretty big and he just couldn't believe it. So he wanted to know what I had planned for it. And I told him my, my story about uh, the grove of my own, the literary grove of my own. And he said, no, uh, I think this needs to be a book. And so probably 
two years later, he called one day and said, I sold your book um, at HarperCollins, so I'd like you to start right now. Um, and from there, as, as, as you must know, uh, especially Kristen, anyone who grows trees, it's profoundly difficult to do so. Um, you know, the reason that uh, there are so many seeds on the ground is because they need that, uh, that cushion. Uh, it's one in a thousand that actually uh, makes it past the, uh, the worms and the bacteria and ultimately uh, my nemesis, the uh, gray squirrel, um, and uh, grows to be an actual tree. So I had all of these trees littered around my house, some from the south that once I put them outside would never make it. Uh, so I sent out many, many letters looking for people to help me out, and I couldn't find a single one until one day I got a call from the uh, president of the New York State Arborist Association, Brian Sayers, who had heard about my, um, my project, and he came up with his wife um, and said he would do it. And he was the man who, um, in the end, I brought all my seeds to, um, and for two years as I went around the nation, I um, collected these seeds and I, you know, I would have to send them by mail to him, um, uh, by ground mail, because you don't want to put the seeds through, um, through the radiation detectors um, if you send it by, by air via area. So um, anyway, you can see there's the grove, the literary grove. This is out of Clarence, New York. Um, I think we're standing in the Muhammad Ali Catalpa Grove there. You can see a lot. Uh, he had this greenhouse built for this project. I think at one point we had over 20,000 seeds that I had collected. Um, so he's the man. Um, unfortunately, he has recently moved uh, out of Clarence. Uh, his son owns the property now. He's up um, in in Canada near Toronto. Uh, and so the project, I mean, it, it, it continues um, apace. I mean, it's just a matter of collecting seeds, but once you start um, growing these trees, there's no stopping. You have to attend to them constantly. And there were lots of um, tragedies um, from weather to, again, the, the gray squirrel, eastern gray squirrels getting into the uh, the greenhouse. Um, but anyway, these, this is a project that will outlive me and, and you know, likely my children and their children. Um, we, we have started something that um, is just a labor of love. And um, again, the only limitation is, um, is place. Uh, time will take care of itself. But, um, you know, if you collect seeds from California, uh, they're not going to grow in Clarence, New York. Um, however, in a greenhouse, you can grow just about anything. All right, uh, let's get to it. Um, so getting back to Carl Leonard, um, so the head marketing manager at Harper Collins, um, he had some input, um, you know, as far as he, he was more an editor of my list than an editor of, of my book, although he was that too. Um, this when people ask how is it writing the book i don't even remember it It was just so fast and furious every time i would go out and collect i'd come back and and dash off a couple of chapters and um it came together so so naturally so easily um you know I, i'm by trade i was a fiction writer um and i'm very proud of that but about 2000 the, the market for people like myself writing literary fiction kind of collapsed. Uh, it was very difficult to sell fiction. Um, but nonfiction, or I call this a, um, a nature travel log, um, that was very popular. And of course, you know, that's what writings become sort of trendy in, in one way or another. Um, so this sort of was on the wave of that um, back to nature trend, which I hope never goes away. It still exists. This is a 150 acre, uh, 150 year old beech tree from Esther Forbes house. Um, and that's um, in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, the house is gone, but the tree is there. Father planted it. Uh, it was grafted onto um, 
oh gosh, what it was grafted onto, I think, a black walnut tree that's native to that. Um, and you can see they actually have uh, support beams for the, the branches that are so wide. Uh, beech trees, of course, are a climax species. It's the, the end of the line for um, forests when they grow. The, the, the hardest of the hardest wood, wood is, is a beech tree other than the uh, hop horn beam. But um, there it is. And all around the property are 150 year old trees that were there when she was writing her books. And if you're not familiar with Esther Forrest, she had a great influence on my life. Um, she wrote uh, Johnny Tremaine. So again, a lot of the places that I visited are books and authors who personally influenced me. So maybe a lot of people don't know who Esther Forbes are, is, but uh, she, she uh, really influenced me um, as a young kind of um, hyperactive kid. Um, you know, I was diagnosed with that early on. And uh, so it was very difficult for my parents to get me reading. But once I started reading, um, things got better. And uh, she was one of those first books. Um, Shirley Jackson, The Lottery, up in Bennington, Vermont. Uh, she actually has two houses there uh, in Bennington. And um, this is where uh, she wrote, of course, The Lottery. Um, and all around are wonderful uh, maple trees. Um, and there's, um, again, that sort of ghostly presence. You can feel it. Uh, she was quite a character. She taught down in Syracuse and uh, in the writing program there, and they kind of uh, they kind of rode her out of uh, out of town because she was um, <laughs> she was a wild gal. Uh, so they had wild parties and so on. Um, and she, you know, said what she wanted and did what she wanted. And uh, people in Syracuse weren't too happy with that. But uh, she had success in her own right. And Bennington's a beautiful town. They have a college there uh, with a pretty good reputation uh, for. Um, for writers and writing, the writing program there is well well known. So this was fun. I was there with a friend of mine and um, who was kind of more aggressive, um, and he was inclined to knock on doors and and see if uh, if they would let us walk around. Um, at this house, it was okay, but the other house, they really didn't want us there. Um, Willa Cath Cather, uh, one of my favorite authors. Um, up in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, near um, Peterborough, which is the, uh, I believe, is the originating point for Earth Day. So the very first Earth Day was sort of organized and originated out of Peterborough, which is right down the road from Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Willa Cather wrote My Antonia, O Pioneers, um, just a great, um, great author. This was the only, um, tree and the only time where I visited cemeteries, I had no intention of gathering seeds from trees near where authors were buried. I was only interested in trees that had connections with these people. Um, however, I learned that she and her partner would often come to this very spot, sit on the stone wall um, and talk about uh, the books that, that she was writing. Um, so this was a special place to her. Jaffrey um, is a pretty rural community, uh, the mountains all around, trees all around. Um, and that's her headstone. And, um, but again, uh, it's the only time that I gathered seeds from, um, from a spot on, at a cemetery. Um, and, um, but it, there's a church up the road, it's a very, uh, serene place, um, wonderful, and you can tell why she would feel in a meditative state at, at, at that place. Um, okay, one of my favorites, and these are guys, I, I brought some catalpa seeds uh, for Rice Creek and their, um, their tree growing project. Um, in Louisville, Kentucky on Grand Avenue. Um, so that would be on the east side of town. Um, Muhammad Ali grew up and um, 
I actually knocked on the door many years ago. I would go down there for the AP read. I, I was a reader for the advanced placement exam and they would always meet in Louisville. And so I found out his address and I knocked on the door. There was a lovely woman with a small child who lived there at the time, asked her if I could uh, take some of the catalpa uh, seeds, the pods that drooped down from this tree. And she said, no problem. Interestingly, you can see uh, forward and backward of that photograph, um, there were no trees on any of the houses, uh, lawns, except that one. Um, Muhammad Ali's uh, front yard had a tree. All the rest on Grand Avenue, for the most part, did not. Um, so there was, again, that sort of special moment for me when I realized that the only tree on the street was one in front of Muhammad Ali's house. Um, and there it is. I'm sad to report um, when I went the last time, which was probably around 2015 to visit the tree, someone had bought the house, cut the tree down and turned it into a, a museum. So there's a plaque out front. Um, and, you know, the, the, the lawn is all perfectly manicured but the tree is gone. Um, however, fortunately, we have a lot of these uh, catalpa seeds uh, growing. I have three of them on my property right here on uh, Rice Creek Field Station, right contiguous to it. Um, so there's plenty of those to go around. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's house. So a little history. Um, this is Monticello. That's the last remaining tree. It's a cypress. Um, uh, that he actually planted. Uh, there were two tulip poplars uh, that are actually on the coin and I believe on the $2 bill wh where the artist rendered them uh, from the back of Monticello, two huge soaring uh, tulip poplars. Um, unfortunately, the year I got there, um, the the second one, um, now there's one that's growing that's old, but it wasn't old enough to have been there when he was alive. However, the one that had been cut down when I arrived uh, had been there when he um, was alive. The good news was, if you know anything about tulip poplar trees, not only are they the largest hardwood, but they have lots and lots and lots of seeds. So um, luck would have it. Um, and, and, and the, the cut um, was still fresh. I mean, you could see that it had just recently been cut down. Uh, I was able to um, collect a lot of seeds from that tree. They were still on the lawn. Uh, that's how uh, prolific they are. Um, so anyway, and there was nothing from the cypress. I could not find a, a single um, cone from that. Um, but he was interesting. He was a lover of of trees and had a lot of sugar maples planted all around his yard um, because he wished to make uh, maple syrup. But of course, uh, Virginia being the way it is uh, in the, that sort of temperate zone, uh, he could grow, he could produce no uh, maple syrup. So um, on the back lawn, uh, there are lots and lots of maple uh, trees, uh, sugar maple trees. Um, they're not original, but they're the progeny of those that he had planted. Uh, this is a wonderful, this is just an amazing tree. Um, this is a pecan tree. Uh, and my uh, tour guide, uh, a bookseller named Steve, Stephen Wallace, a prolific reader, uh, very proud of his, um, his Southern literary um, brethren, he brought me here. This is Montgomery, Alabama, where F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald lived uh, right after they came back from, from Paris. He, um, he wrote, um, um, oh boy, now I'm my senior moment. I, it wasn't um, uh, The Great Gatsby. I'm trying to think of uh, the name. It'll come to me. But in, in any case, he would write up in the top on the second floor looking out the window and this is the tree he would look at. And my, um, my tour guide, Stephen Wallace, said it was the largest pecan tree he had ever seen. And so we were able to find some pecans um, that it was a little bit out of season, but <clears throat> um, as one of my friends uh, who was also a 
type of arborist uh, when he came with me on some of my seed gathering tours. He he um, vociferated something that um, I, I I hadn't, but I, I kind of implicitly knew, knew that once you arrive at a site, you look around, you don't see much. Um, but as time passes slowly, um, the seeds seem to find you and you suddenly become more and more and more aware of the natural um, history of, of the area and you become aware of all the plants and, um, and what they have to offer. Um, so there is something, um, yeah, again, um, inherent in our, um, our vision, our perception of, of the natural world. We're so used to looking out a, a window or through a windshield or at a screen uh, that we're not really aware of, of what's going on um, in the natural world. But when you start to um, interact in that manner, uh, there's, there's definitely something um, second nature in, in human perception where you um, bit by bit become aware of, uh, of the things that you want to be aware of, um, like seeds, like plants, like trees. Um, anyway, there's my soapbox, soapbox speech. All right, out to California. Uh, this is Jay Krishnamurti. He's sort of my favorite philosopher. Um, he uh, wrote a piece called The Function of Education that really um, turned me on to uh, teaching. And um, it was, I think, instrumental in my um, pursuing education as a career other than writing. Um, and it was said that under this, um, this is a California oak tree, um, that he, he wrote the function of education, which is only a three, three page, about a thousand word essay on, um, on education. Um, so, Ojai, California is inland from Ventura, California, about, uh, oh, I don't know, 25 miles. So, pretty close to the, to the coast. Uh, the Los Padres National Forest is in the background there. Um, if you've ever been out to California, um, most of the trees there, other than these, uh, these oaks, are not native but they grow an amazingly. I mean, I saw the greatest, the, the largest redbud tree I've ever seen. It was um, the, the bowl or the trunk the size of an oak tree um, in, um, in Orange County, uh, California. Uh, okay, this um, is more sacred um, uh, connections. That is the Bodhi tree under which the Buddha is uh, reputed to have had his enlightenment experience. So this Bodhi tree, if you can see the leaves, are it's an extraordinary tree. It has these, these long tails that come off uh, the leaf. Um, and that's something, if you look at photographs of, of the Buddha, you'll see that his ears often have this big tail to this big droop. Um, and that is supposed to, supposedly a representative of fertility and long life. Um, but that uh, is a tree that was taken from a cutting um, of the actual um, tree under which um, in Sri Lanka that um, the Buddha had his enlightenment um, experience. And uh, so that is Michael Cronin who is the archivist at the uh, J. Krishnamurti retreat. Um, and um, yeah, so that was just amazing. Um, and we did get seeds from that. Um, this is another um, uh, sacred tree. This is a California pepper tree. And under this tree, um, Krishnamurti was said to have had um, an enlightenment experience. And um, so I sat there for quite a while. Um, I have brought some seeds from that tree to Rice Creek. I'm going to give them to, uh, to the folks here. Um, California pepper trees are, are really extraordinary. You can see the leaves uh, much like a, um, 
I'm trying to think of, of trees that have that sort of spindly uh, leaf. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. This has fallen on its side, as you can see, um, and they built this wall to support it. So it's quite old. Um, when Krishna Rarity back in, I think it was 1929, had this experience, he was seated under it. Of course, it was um, standing straight up. Yeah, I, I know what I wanted to say. It was uh, those are leaves very much like the locust tree, if you know what a locust, honey locust tree. All right, um, out and up the coast to uh, Big Sur, uh, the Henry Miller Library. Um, these are, you know, probably some of the oldest living uh, organisms on the planet. These are redwoods. Uh, they are asexual, that is, they, they send up rhizomes from mother trees, so in a way they're eternal. Um, they can grow from, from cones, but many of them end up growing from a mother tree. So many of these trees are, you know, a thousand years old, and yet, you know, they grew up from a, a, another tree that was a thousand years old. So. Um, it is extraordinary if you haven't experienced um, these these amazing trees, how, how majestic, how tall, uh, how humbling it is uh, to stand under them. Um, so we uh, were able to collect a few things, um, take some clippings and so on. Again, you have to be respectful. You can't just walk on people's property and start clipping and, and uh, collecting. Um, but uh, we, we were successful. I, I don't know if um, I have to ask Brian if he has any um, Henry Miller Redwoods. Um, but uh, we, we got some other Henry Miller stuff. Um, Big Sur is really quite extraordinary. He lived there for about, uh, what was it, 10 years. And this was after he came back from Paris um, after the war in the 40s. Uh, he moved down to Pacific Palisades. Here he is. Uh, that's his house in Pacific Palisades. Um, I've forgotten what kind of tree this is, uh, but it was certainly old enough um, to have been around when he was there. It's out in his front yard. Um, and again, Pacific Palisades represents that classic Southern California place where you can grow anything and it grows like a monster. Um, it, it, it's, um, it's a fabulous place for trees, um, um, you know, un unless they're burning uh, as they have been inland. But this, uh, the Pacific Palisades, if you know anything about uh, Los Angeles, so it's a kind of an affluent area just above, like looking down at Santa Monica um, and, and the Pacific, there are lots of overviews. Uh, this was really um, extraordinary, um, and uh, that's what's called a pollarded tree, where the, um, and I believe it's some sort of ash tree, where they take and they clip, um, and from those nodules will grow um, uh, branches, um, very straight, um, and hardwood, of course, as, as an ash, and then they would make uh, broom handles out of them. Um, so that's a, a very old tree. And uh, what was really interesting here, I remember taking pictures of it, asking about it. This woman who had an Eastern accent, uh, she sounded like someone from uh, FDR era, and she probably was. She was very old. She was in her 90s, had known uh, Henry Miller quite well, didn't like him because he rode too fast on his bike around the neighborhood, she said. Um, but she she instructed me about this idea of pollarding of, of trees um, to make broom handles out of it. And so on the lawns all around the neighborhood were these magnificent trees. Um, and, and as I, I just described, Henry was forever on his bike riding around the neighborhood. Uh, okay, so up the road, even closer to San Francisco, uh, then we had um, Ken Kesey. That's his house, very famous. Uh, it's where he started his um, trek around the, <clears throat> the country and the uh, electric Kool-Aid acid test uh, written by um, Tom Wolfe and uh, the bus named Further. 
Um, apparently in the back of the house, uh, there were redwood trees that were painted day glow uh, that they, the, you know, they painted on their LSD trips and so on. Uh, it was quite the, quite the place. And um, we were very fortunate. We did not cross over uh, that bridge because all of that is their land. Uh, however, we had some old hippies come by in a, in a van who were very curious about what we were doing. And what we were able to find um, were some of these Oregon maples. Uh, these are very old um, and they were right out in front uh, of the house. So uh, again, um, you know, there has to be um, sort of a, um, a literary license taken here where um, you just find your way when you get to a site and, and know that certain uh, certain organisms had um, contact with these folks. So this, in La Honda, California, at least back in 2010 or 11 when I was there, it didn't look any different than it probably had looked uh, 100 years before. I don't know now. Um, uh, there's an old bar down the road that's uh, supposedly haunted. Um, we sat and had lunch, and, uh, but it, you could tell it hadn't been cleaned in years and uh, probably looked exactly uh, the same as it did when the, um, I'm trying to, the, the merry hipsters uh, came in and parked their bus further out front. Anyway, this is where Ken Kesey lived for many years. Um, then inland to Martinez, California, this is uh, John Muir's home <clears throat> after he left um, Yosemite he um, he came. He was married. He came and lived here. Was quite a successful farmer. He had um, orange groves, um, fruit trees, and uh, made quite a lot of money. Uh, but he wasn't interested in that, and uh, he hated his house and he hated being inside. Uh, if you're a reader of John Muir, which I am, you can feel his anxiety. I uh, didn't like to write, uh, but he knew it was a necessity. Um, this was a place I felt very intimidated. Uh, you know, I, I, again, you, you have to um, have a literary license to do this. And I felt like I was violating uh, in, in some ways, but I had a great experience where there were little uh, bay, bay trees growing and uh, pine trees um, that obviously for, were from the trees above that were quite old and um, so I was very furtively, you know, digging with my keys and, and putting these fully grown saplings in bags and then looked up and there was <clears throat> a forest ranger, you know, they wear the green hat and all that. Um, and uh, he pointed and he said, uh, you know, uh, those aren't the best ones to take. I would take these over here. <laughs> so, uh, so I felt sponsored. I, uh, uh, you know, I was supported when I went there. Um, and there was a, an ancient fig tree that he had planted. Uh, we weren't able to find any figs from it, but we were able to look at it and take pictures of it. Uh, kind of running out of time, I, I, I do get going. So here's, um, if you can see that building over in the corner, this is uh, Jackson Park. That's where Sherwood Anderson and uh, William Faulkner lived when they were uh, living in New Orleans. And these old live oak trees, um, I am absolutely sure were there when they were hanging around. Uh, there are park benches underneath those trees and more than likely they sat there and wrote and thought their thoughts. New Orleans, again, is a very special place. Um, and unfortunately, Katrina wiped out a lot of, of trees. I was, uh, well, uh, again, I, I had just great luck in meeting a man um, who, um, who walked me around. He was a real character uh, of the uh, Latin Quarter, uh, the French Quarter, excuse me, and, um, and showed me, you know, as many trees as I wanted to see that were still around. Uh, Tennessee Williams lived there. Um, I wanted to get in there and uh, uh, get some banana seeds because he was famous to have, it was known that he had planted a banana tree, uh, banana, Bananas are very hard to grow. Uh, the seeds, uh, you know, if you ever take that uh, 
that job. Um, it's, it's not an easy one. You have to do uh, lots and lots of work to get those bananas to grow. Um, but there are a lot of people, a lot of famous writers um, connected to the French Quarter and Jackson Park is the place. Uh, there are magnolias, old, old magnolias there. That's fun. Um, Eudora Welty, Jackson, Mississippi. This is uh, one of the few writers who actually stayed put. I didn't realize how many writers are kind of like me, uh, just traveling around the world, living in different places here and there. But uh, you do a wealthy lived in this house for 75 years. Um, to the right, you can see a, a fairly young water uh, oak that I uh, unfortunately had missed out a couple of years before a, a tree that she wrote quite a lot about had died and they cut it down. But actually I did better in the backyard. You can see the water oaks in the backyard. And in the backyard, she had two gardens and that's where she spent most of her time. Uh, she had one that was a perennial garden and one an annual garden. And, um, and she would be in that garden all day under the shade of those trees, thinking her thoughts, writing her books. Uh, and there they are. Um, that was, again, as I said, starting this um, talk um, with the, the, with a tornado coming through town or, or almost a tornado, uh, knocking all those branches off. You can see I wouldn't have been able to climb up there, but uh, they graciously, um, uh, the, um, the literary seed gods and goddesses uh, knocked those branches down full of seeds. Uh, okay, and so then my last... Um, I ended my um, my tour, my seed gathering at the place that I kind of started my own literary career uh, at Helen Keller's house. Uh, when I was eight years old, again, I, I, I had terrible um, um, hyperactivity and, um, and I, I wouldn't read. And uh, so my parents got me in, uh, tutored by, a, by an, an ex-librarian. Um, and she read um, Helen Keller's biography to me. Um, and when I found out that Helen Keller, who was about my age, uh, when she wrote the book, uh, was also deaf and blind, and a girl, uh, I said, no way. Um, and uh, so then I, I told the librarian that I was going to write a book, too. Um, and, um, and so I later I did. Uh, anyway, uh, this was, again, a preternatural event in that when we got there, it was closed. Um, this is all surrounded by high fences. But oddly, there was noise, and there were people talking. And as we got around toward the house, the gate was open. We heard voices. We came in. And then, of course, uh, I was lost in that moment because there's nothing but seeds everywhere. That I'm... I, I know is an old magnolia tree and I'm picking up seeds, probably a tree that she had felt and, and played around. Um, and uh, before we knew it, the cops had arrived um, and it looked like they were gonna arrest us. They were pretty angry that we were on this property. Uh, but I told them, well, look, there's all that talking going on in the back and, and, the, and the gate was open. Uh, so the cop, so there were four of them. One of them went and said, well, I don't know, someone left the recording on. I don't understand why that was on. And then the other, there was another policeman who said, uh, yeah, that gate was open. What's it doing open? I, um, that's supposed to be closed. So it was sort of a welcome from Helen Keller, welcoming myself and my, my nephew into the property. And there were so many seats there. I, uh, you know, my bag was full. <laughs> So I've got lots of Helen Keller seeds. Um, and you can see just these amazing trees. Um, I, I forget what kind that is to the left. And, uh, oh yeah, so then um, I thought that was the last. This is my nephew who's a, an artist and he and my sister did some of the, um, um, all of the artwork, actually. They, they uh, drew pictures of the artwork. And at William Faulkner's house, that is uh, really, um, I would suggest to anyone who's interested in trees um, to go and visit Rowan Oak. Um, uh, this is an Osage orange, and that's an old Osage orange. If you've never seen Osage orange seed, it's, it's, it's 
phenomenal. It's bigger. It's uh, it's bigger than a softball. It's more like a, between a football and a softball. Um, and this was, I was told that is a basket oak. And you can see the size of that, and that's in the backyard. So um, kind of getting to the end here, that's back at uh, Pacific Palisades. There I am. You can see how I um, gathered my seeds. And these are um, some of the illustrations from my sister, uh, who's also an artist. Uh, here's the, the Bodhi tree on the left. California redwood seed. Um, and so, um, anyway, I, I want to end there. Um, I, I actually, at that point, they were so thrilled with seeds, they wanted me to do another book. Uh, so I wrote a book called Harvest, uh, and I went around the country and um, participated in the harvests of, again, some of my favorite foods. Um, and uh, that's another story altogether. At this point, I think I just like to take some um, some questions. So, if anyone has questions, here I am. Question. Certainly. Um, so you went around collecting all these seeds. And then you talked about bringing the seeds back and growing them uh, in the greenhouse. Presumably, they start to grow and grow and grow. What happens when the trees reach the sort of critical stage where they need to be outside somewhere? Where, where do they go? Uh, well, thank you for that, John. Uh, great to see you. Great question. Uh, again, that's what uh, Brian Sayers, uh, my arborist friend, has provided. Because uh, when this project started many years ago, it was just ridiculous. All I had were these um, these small saplings growing in windows window uh, on windowsills throughout my house. And then in the summertime, I'd take them outside, and that um, and that little grove of of trees kept growing and getting bigger and uh, what was I going to do with them? Um, so you, um, to grow trees, as Kristen and, and the folks at Rice Creek will tell you, um, you, <laughs> you need to know what you're doing. Uh, you need to have the resources, um, uh, greenhouses and uh, people who are aware of, of, of disease and so on. Um, it's um, my friend uh, Brian Sayers, who, by the way, is also now now president of the Tree Fund, uh, which is a program where they um, uh, they provide scholarship money for people interested in becoming arborists. But they're also growing. They're part of the uh, million tree or billion trees program. Um, so uh, it's it's a difficult task, um, and it's one that outlives you. Uh, trees grow slowly. They're usually they live longer than we do, um, and uh, so you you have to have. Uh, the facility for it. But um, like myself, uh, I have lots of um, oaks and maples and catalpas and trees uh, growing on my property that will grow because I'm in the same uh, zone um, for those those trees to grow so I don't have to worry about them. It's really that the trees that come from places like California and, and Mississippi and Louisiana and so on, Florida, that um, what what Brian Sayers has done is he he sells these trees, um, um, and so that's his first question: Where are you? Uh, what um, zone are you in? And here are the trees that you can um, you can purchase, and um, and that will grow in your zone. I hope that answers your question. Okay, just, uh, a comment. Um, yes. Uh, thank you for um, for this talk. And uh, I really appreciate um, any seeds or seedlings, especially the Muhammad Ali Catalpa can grow here. Um, also, just like a comment, if you're not familiar with or if you missed the sweet gum and its 40 seeds, um, we have at least three in front of uh, the campus center. Um, 
but they're not like the southern uh, states from Sweden. But they are there anyway, and they're doing it. I do love the sweet gums. Um, and of course, uh, with this climate crisis happening, uh, we can see the weather changing. Um, and so these, um, these zones, uh, these, these uh, growing zones will um, have to be um, um, edited and, um, and reworked. I, I, I don't doubt that um, certain trees now um, that, you know, previously could not grow in a climate like uh, where we are, are, are now um, probably uh, viable in this zone. I, I was just down in Ithaca uh, yesterday, and um, I, I couldn't believe how, um, how warm it felt down there. Um, and that's, you know, what, 83 miles from here. Um, so I don't doubt that a place like Ithaca, Ithaca will be, um, similar to, uh, to, to what Virginia was, you know, 100 years ago. Well, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap this one up um, because we are running out of time. But Richard, that was so interesting to hear about your project and your book. And hopefully people who have more questions, um, you know, they could pick up a copy of your book. Um, and thank you again for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, your project very similar to mine. So um, if there's if, if you have nothing to do on a, on a certain day, just go outside, take a look around at the trees and maybe find some seeds, plant them, see what happens. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you.